For years, she played the perfect wife, showering me with affection while weaving a web of lies that spanned decades. But one fateful evening, her carefully crafted deception unraveled, exposing the shocking truth about my family and unleashing a carefully calculated revenge that would leave her life in ruins. Life can mess up your plans, which is why I don't bother planning anymore. I used to be big on planning before my divorce. At work, I'd planned for all possible emergencies in my department. I had backup plans ready in case the main ones didn't work. Today, I got a call saying I needed to see my ex-wife. I hadn't seen her in over a year and wasn't keen on it, but since my daughter asked, I had to go. My daughter Sally was really persistent, so I drove back to town. It took me almost an hour to get through the busy freeways to the city hospital where Sally had taken her mom. I parked and hoped I wouldn't be there long. At the information desk, I learned my ex-wife, Erin, had been in the hospital for two days. A nurse took me to her room, but said she was still asleep. What's wrong with her, I asked. Your wife, she started. I interrupted, saying, ex-wife, very ex-wife. With a smile, the nurse smiled back, but then looked serious. Dad, seriously? You aren't flirting with the nurse while mom's in the hospital. Are you said my daughter behind me? Of course not, Sally, I said. If I were flirting seriously, I would have at least asked. I glanced at the nurse, Bonnie. Ooh, that name suits you, I said. My daughter then pushed me into her mom's room, breaking our smiley moment. The room had four beds, and was the most depressing place I'd been in, whether in a hospital or anywhere else. This room is terrible. Huh, she said. I shrugged. Dad, she's here cause she doesn't have health insurance. Darren can't add her to our plan. The only person who could her voice trailed off. Sally, honey, I love you more than anyone. I'd do almost anything for you, but you gotta get that your mom and I are divorced. I did everything the judge said, but not everything she wanted, Sally said softly. We stood by the bed, looking at the sleeping woman. She never wanted a divorce. You know, Sally said quietly. She still loves you, even now. People in hell want ice water, I said coldly. But they're down there for what they did. Your mom and I are divorced because of what she did when we were married. I know what she did, Sally said. I was there. But I can't help but feel you two still belong together. She loves you so much, Dad. Look at her. She's falling apart. Some people don't age well, I said coldly. Maybe she needs to take care of herself. She needs her husband, Sally spat. She needs love and care. That's why she's wasting away. You woke me up for this, I said mockingly. Who's her husband? Do you have any compassion, Sally asked. You don't know compassion, I snapped. I put up with her for years, gave her chances, but she couldn't let go. Dad, don't you want someone to settle down with and enjoy life for good? Been there. Done that, I said bitterly. Thought I had that person. Loved her enough to put my pride aside and try to fix things, even after I found out what she was doing. But she couldn't let it go. Some women can love two men at once, Samantha said. And some men can handle that, I replied. But not me. Why am I here anyway? I've been here since we brought her, Samantha said. I needed a break to go home, shower, change, and to see my husband. Darren sat with her yesterday, but he doesn't like mom. He used to. Until. Three families are almost destroyed because of two messed up people, I said. Maybe they belong together. Don't you have any compassion, Samantha asked. Sometimes I can't find my heart, I snapped. She tore it out, didn't she? You already got your revenge, Samantha asked. You've crushed her spirit. What more do you want? I didn't get revenge, I said. I walked away. I still don't understand, Samantha said. You're not the type to walk away. There's so much I don't get in these two years since the divorce. Like what I asked. We split everything, except the house. It just didn't make sense, she said. Mom didn't want any of that stuff. She just wanted you. And it just seemed like you guys should have had way more money than you actually did. Your mom's lawyer went over all of our finances, I shrugged. So dad, then why are you driving a customized Mustang that my husband claims cost at least $50,000? When mom can't even afford a car, she asked. Maybe my credit is better, I said. Anyway, I'll sit here and play games on my iPad while she sleeps for a few hours. I'll give you a break, honey. Hopefully she won't wake up. If she does, I'll call you immediately. What's wrong with her anyway? Dad. Mom has been diagnosed with severe depression symptoms. She's actually on medication. For some reason, she took all of her pills at once. We had to have her stomach pumped. She also hasn't been eating the way she should. And she's been drinking too much alcohol. She's exhausted and dehydrated. And we still don't know whether she took all the pills by accident or if she was trying something, said Sammy. So, the chances are she probably won't even wake up. Right, I asked, smiling. Right, said Sammy. But dad, if she does, please be nice to her. For me. Okay, Sammy, I said. My daughter kissed me on the cheek and left the room. I sat down in the chair next to the bed and got out my iPad. I started out opening the book one was reading but quickly lost track of the book as my thoughts wandered back to two years ago when this had all started. We do strange things for our kids. When Sally was little, she liked making odd mixes of candy. I love her so much, so I'd eat whatever she made and say it was great. Once, she invited us over for dinner. It was nice, but Samantha still couldn't cook the roast was super dry. Darren kept refilling my drink, probably knowing the roast wasn't good. 
Luckily, I don't drink much, or I'd have been drunk. It was nice spending time with family. I hung out with Samantha's son, John, named after me. He was adorable and could do no wrong in my eyes. The highlight was when Sam and Darren told us she was pregnant again. Darren, what are you doing to my daughter? I joked. We discussed the usual topics when our kids are expecting. We all liked the name Elizabeth, if it's a girl after Darren's mom. I suggested Peter for a boy, after Darren's dad, which he liked. Then, things took a turn. You already have a grandkid named after you, Aaron said. Let someone else pick this time. What do you have in mind, I teased. Let me guess Erica for a girl. Eric for a boy. Well, actually, I was thinking Randall, she said. We could call him Randy. Randall James Dillon sounds nice. The mood changed suddenly. Samantha looked at me. I'm not sure about that, she said. I prefer dad's suggestion. Don't you, Darren? Darren hadn't looked at me yet. He was still smiling, thinking about his dad being happy with a grandkid named after him. He just nodded. Aaron reached for my hand, but I pulled away sharply. Samantha hadn't noticed my reaction. What do you think, Dad, she asked. In a cold tone, I replied, I think naming him that would be as big a mistake as the one your mother just made. Have you ever seen one of those scenes in the movies or on TV where everyone is at a party, having a good time? There are people dancing, music playing, people are eating and drinking and laughing everywhere. Then, someone does something really stupid, and everything just stops, and every head turns towards them. Usually the music stops, and you hear a sound like the needle scratching on an old record at the same time. Well, it was that kind of moment, for what seemed like an hour, but was probably no more than a few seconds. No one said anything. Then, Darren broke the silence in a diplomatic way. He looked at his watch and said, Wow, I really have to get to bed. I've got an early meeting tomorrow. Thanks for a great evening, Darren. I said, I love you. Sammy, then I got up and headed for the door. As I was opening the door, Samantha called, Dad. What is wrong with you, she asked. Aren't you forgetting something? Well, Come on over here and hug me, Sammy, I said. I have to get out of here. I can't even breathe. I was talking about mom, she smirked. I thought you didn't drink, Darren. Just what have you been filling my father's glass with all night? It's Pepsi, sweetheart, I said. Although right now I could use some liquor. What is wrong with you, John asked Aaron, coming over to me. She reached out for me again, and this time I moved away from her, so obviously that everyone saw it. We're going to talk about this when we get home, honey, she said. We aren't doing anything, I snapped. I'm going back to my house. I have no idea what you're doing or where you're going, but it's not with me. Wait, wait a minute. Dad said Samantha. You're mad at mom because she didn't like the name you came up with. Aaron's eyes widened then, because she suddenly knew that I knew. No, honey, I said. I'm not mad or angry at all. I've just finally come to my senses. There are times when the people who love you do things to hurt you, and you just let it go. There are times when you suffer in silence because you think that if you just get past this one little thing, you can go on and things will be better in the end. But then something happens that lets you know that you've suffered and made allowances for nothing. Sometimes, some things just can't be let go of. Everyone in the room was looking at me, except Aaron. She already knew what I was talking about. Dad, you're not making any sense, said Samantha. Sammy, your mother wants you to name my grandson after the man she's been in love with for the past 15 years or so, the guy she had an affair with. She found out a couple of days ago that he recently died. She's trying to let his memory live on, in my grandson. Both Samantha and Darren looked at Aaron who had fallen to the floor and was silently sobbing. I'm so sorry, John, she said. It's over. It's been over for more than five years. I've been trying to be the best wife possible to you. Why did it end? Aaron, I asked. Because I felt so guilty, she said. I knew that what I was doing was wrong, so I ended it. Can't we talk about this in the first place? It wasn't an affair. We only got together once a year, and we didn't even always have sex. And after I came home, you and I always had the best sex we've ever had. It's been over for a long time. I love you, John. We needed to talk about this. You don't understand this. It's not as bad as it seems. It's worse than you think it is. Aaron, I snapped. Maybe when the divorce is over, you'll tell someone the truth. But I'm sick of you lying. What do you mean, she said. I admitted it, John. If it was up to your lying ass, you'd still be seeing him, I said. I told you I ended it, she snapped. And you're lying again, I said. I ended it. You what she asked. I went to Boston and met him five years ago. I said. I beat the crap out of him. He was in the hospital before your pitiful, cheating witch was off of the plane. I took his phone, and I got all of your texts. I'll probably be using them as evidence. I also told him who I was, and let him know that the next time he came anywhere near you would be his last. I told him that I'd also let his wife know about the two of you. I told him that if he ever tried to contact you for any reason, even just plain friendship, I'd be back. So, you didn't end anything, Aaron. I did. John, I'm sorry, she said. I was wrong. I was confused. It was a mistake. I'm sorry too. Aaron, I said. I was wrong too. I was confused too. I made a mistake too. I was wrong to try to save this messed up marriage. I did it for Sammy though. I didn't want her to have to deal with us splitting up until she was out on her own. I was confused too. You see, I thought that maybe, in time, since I loved you so much that we could get past this, I made a mistake. Instead of ending this sham then, I really tried to make it work. 
but at least you were right. Honey, you did end something. From the first second that you uttered his name tonight, you ended our marriage. I walked right out of the house, got into my car, and drove away. I spent a long time that night just driving around. The roar of my Mustang's engine and the thrill of speeding through the darkness of the moonlit night took away some of my pain. I turned off my phone so I wouldn't be disturbed. I really wasn't as upset as it seemed. I'd known about what she'd done for over five years, and for that whole time I'd been preparing for the divorce. In more ways than one, Erin was probably more shocked by tonight than I was. First, because she had no idea that I knew about her affair, and secondly, because she really only found out that night why it had ended. She'd flown to Boston for a conference the same one she went to every year. She got a room in the hotel she always stayed in. The conference was a one-day seminar that she always told me was two days long. After the conference ended, she had dinner with Randall. They sat there in the restaurant, talking to each other until the restaurant closed. She even mentioned me a couple of times. Then, when the restaurant closed, they exchanged a very nice kiss, and she went back to her room. Randall went out to the parking lot in his car to drive home. As Randy got to his car, I was sitting on the hood. Hey, that's my car, he said. I'm sorry, I said. It's wrong for people to bother things that don't belong to them, isn't it, Randy? I agree. Totally, he said. Let's not talk about hubcaps, Randy. Let's talk about Mary, your wife, who right now is waiting for you at your house on Sycamore Street. It's probably too late for me to go over there to talk to her right now. I should probably wait until tomorrow to visit her. I'm calling the police, said Randy. I pulled out my phone and tried to hand it to him. Randy, you can call the police anytime you want. It'll be my word against yours, and either way, you'll lose. Because somehow, in all of it, the fact that you've been spending time with my wife, Aaron, while your own faithful little wife was waiting at home for you, will come out. Randy's whole face went pale. I'm not the sharing type of guy, Randy, I said. I think you've made a mistake, he said. I do know Aaron, but we haven't spent any time together, he looked at me, and saw how serious my face was. Okay, we had dinner together tonight. Some of the things we learned at the conference were interesting, and we both wanted someone to talk about them with. But that's it. Nothing happened. We just lost track of time. Woo, I said. You had me worried. He smiled at me like he was glad we cleared everything up. I punched him in the face as hard as I could. He went down like a bowling pin. Then he got on his feet and started running. I threw his hubcap and caught him in the legs. He tripped over it and fell heavily again. I pounced on him and started beating him mercilessly. When I was done, his face was a pulp. You really had me worried, Randy, I said. For a moment there, I really thought that I wasn't going to get to beat the crap out of you. I know that all you had was dinner tonight I was there. What about last year or the year before? How long has this been going on? Maybe 15 or 20 years, he sputtered through his busted lips. It's over, Randy, I said. He nodded quickly. If you so much as say her name ever again, I'll end your marriage and your life. Are we clear? He nodded again. Don't visit her, I said. Don't write her or even call her. There will be no further warnings. I got it, he said. Randy, the next time we talk won't be this pleasant, I said. Apparently it worked. When I got back home, Erin was her usual after the conference self. She tried to kill me with lovemaking, but I just didn't go for it. Usually after she came back from the conference, we'd go off on vacation somewhere together. That year, I pretended to be too busy to get away. As hard as I tried to put the whole thing behind me, I couldn't. A big part of my brain was in Judas Priest mode. Okay, most of you don't know what I'm talking about. There's a heavy metal band called Judas Priest. Arguably, their best album was the one called Screaming for Vengeance, and that was how I felt. Try as I might, I couldn't calm down. I wanted blood. I wanted someone to pay for my pain. If misery loves company, I wanted someone to be miserable with me. And I picked Randy. Through some business connections I had, I got Randy fired. I didn't go all snidely whiplash and let him know that it was me who did it. It was enough that I knew. I felt great about it. I had no regrets about it at all. It gave me the same warm glow that I once got when I did something nice for Aaron. To do something evil to Randy. I've spent the last five years of my life ruining his. At the same time, I was sure that divorce for Aaron and me was inevitable. Why didn't I confront her and file? Because despite what she'd done, I still loved her. In my heart, I really wanted to believe her and give her another chance. But my head just as in my job told me to be prepared for anything. I told Aaron that we were under a raise freeze at work when I actually got a raise a few months later. The promotion I'd been working for the past 10 years was finally mine. I didn't tell Aaron my salary nearly doubled. I diverted most of the new income into accounts that she knew nothing about. Two years later, I got another promotion and another raise. Again, I told Aaron nothing about what was going on. The reason behind all this deception was that in the case of our divorce, she'd have no idea about my actual income. She'd really believe that I was still making 40 grand a year, so that's what our divorce would be based on. My boss had been absolutely raped in his divorce, so he saw no problems in helping me. Officially, on the books, I was listed as a mid-level manager. No one outside of the company ever even asked why all the other managers deferred and reported to me it just seemed like the way our company ran. Three quarters of my actual salary was regularly paid to another company that, 
on the surface, looked like one of our vendors. I was not one of that company's officers, nor did I own it. All of the officers of that company were fishing buddies of mine. In exchange for the usage of their names, I took them fishing once or twice a year. They were all listed as volunteers, so there were no salary or tax implications for them. The money from that company went directly into my offshore account, so there was no tracing it. After that, there were a couple of times that I did withdraw some of the money. Once was after Samantha and Darren got married. I put a large down payment on their house to start them out in their marriage without a lot of financial stress. I didn't buy the house for them outright, but I put enough down that their regular mortgage payments were under $100 a month. The other time was to buy Sam and Darren a second car. Since they both worked, and their jobs weren't in the same part of town, it just made things easier for them. Again, even in giving the kids their gifts, I had to be careful. The way I managed to give them their house and the second car actually worked in my favor and allowed me to give Aaron even less money. The money for their house supposedly came from me, pulling it out of my retirement package. That meant that, in the case of a divorce, I'd have next to nothing in my retirement account for Aaron to get her greedy, cheating hands on. To get the money for the car, I ostensibly took out a loan, which even further lowered my disposable income so I'd be able to give Aaron even less. One of the great things about my situation was that Randall worked in manufacturing he specialized in inspecting castings. My company was also manufacturing based we owned a lot of direct-to-factory manufacturing concerns all across the country. I had a pie friend who lived in Boston. I had him regularly check on Randy. Every time he got a job, I talked to one of our account execs. If we had an account with the company Randy worked for, one of my friends had lunch with someone who worked there, and Randy got fired. If we didn't have an account with Randy's new company, we got one. Then, Randy got fired. I kept a spreadsheet on my computer that was dedicated to keeping track of Randy and all of his misfortunes. Some of them I didn't even cause. After a while, Randy's reputation in the manufacturing community was so bad that he couldn't even interview for a job. Just before Randy passed, his last jobs were in landscaping or day labor. His misfortune had also taken its toll on Randy's marriage. His wife had gone back to work to help support the family. I never touched her or her career because I had nothing against her. I also did my best to make sure that Randy's kids got everything they deserved. I single-handedly got his daughter into law school. I invented a scholarship just for her and gave it to her. Of course, the scholarship ended the year that she got her degree. The scholarship also deposited the full amount into an account she was also never able to find out where the money came from. Her grades were excellent, and she received a few bonuses during her time in school from her mysterious benefactors. The fact that he wasn't able to support his family and barely contributed to their upkeep was rough on Randy. He was a proud man and wanted to be both self-sufficient and a provider. Finding that he was neither hurt his pride, he started drinking and, over time, became obsessive with it. To his credit, he never became violent or abusive towards his wife or his daughter. But towards the end, he was only a shadow of the man he once was. I also looked at the changes my actions brought about in me. I, too, was no longer the man I'd been when I first discovered my wife's cheating. I had always been a soft-spoken, easygoing guy. I'd been open and honest for most of my life. But the trauma of discovering that the woman I loved had betrayed me, on a regular and continuing basis, had unhinged me. When I looked in the mirror, I didn't see a psychopath who could calmly and with relish plan and oversee the systematic destruction of a man whose only mistake had been to have sex with the wrong woman. I still saw myself. I still saw John Foster, an all-around nice guy and family man. Shouldn't a villain have some kind of recognizable traits? In the old days, all of the bad guys wore black hats. Maybe I should trade my Mustang in for a black one, but even as I'd wondered about those things, I continued. I couldn't stop myself. My shattered heart needed revenge more than healing. My soul screamed for vengeance far more than forgiveness. Even as I watched Randy's life fall apart, I watched Aaron. I found that I simply didn't trust her anymore. It's a terrible thing not to have faith in the woman you've pledged to love and cherish forever. But that was one of the things that her affair with Randy did to me. It destroyed not only our marriage, but my ability to trust anyone completely. So for a full five years, while I crushed Randy under my heel, I also watched Aaron and prepared for my divorce. Unlike most men who have a few days, or maybe a few weeks, to try to protect their assets, I had five years to prepare. I'd originally planned for more than that. Aaron had been, though fading, still relatively decent looking when we divorced. I'd intended to wait until she was on the full downswing, but Randy hadn't been able to keep going for as long as I thought. For five years, I'd hidden and squirreled away as much money as I could. I didn't need to worry about the house that we lived in, because it wasn't ours. The home had been in my family for generations. We lived in it because my parents who were still alive didn't need a place that big. When I went through the divorce, I made sure the lawyers knew my parents owned the house and simply allowed me to live there rent-free. When Erin came back from the conference, she texted Randy about how much she'd enjoyed their dinner together and how wonderful the kiss had been. She had also told him that she missed the times when they'd made love, but she was glad that it hadn't happened this year. She'd always felt guilty about being unfaithful to me, as she was sure that Randy felt the same way about his wife. She told him that what they had now, their sexless romance, was actually better 
because they could enjoy their relationship that way until they both died, with no guilt on either side. Maybe they were growing older, and their love didn't need to be expressed physically just being together was enough. That way they'd be together forever, and she ended the text with, until next year, my love. I read that text as I was waiting for my luggage at the airport. I wanted to strangle Aaron, and though I still loved her in some ways, my feelings for her changed drastically. Sometimes, it was hard for me to hold it all together. When Aaron got home, I was sitting in the den, watching a football game. She came in and wrapped her arms around me and tried to kiss me. I moved away from her and told her I had a colder, I had a cold, and didn't want to make her sick. Just make sure we're better by this weekend, she said, smiling. Why? What happens this weekend, I asked. You and I are going off on vacation together, remember, she said. We always go after my boring conference. Well, maybe you could do a mother-daughter vacation and take Sam this year, I said. I really can't get away from work this week. But honey, it's the weekend, she whined. You'd really only miss two days of work. Think about it four nights and three days in Hawaii. It would be just the two of us. Thinking about it gets me hot. We might never leave the hotel room. I bought all kinds of nasty new things to wear. For you. I wondered how many of those things that Randy would have seen if they'd gotten together earlier. Aaron, we're under a wage freeze and the company is trying to cut costs every way they can. I have to make sure that they never get the idea that I'm one of the costs they could cut, I said. I understand, honey, she said. I'll go call Sam. I want you in the bedroom 10 minutes after I get upstairs, though. She went up the stairs, and I heard her talking to my daughter Samantha on the phone. At the same time, she texted Randy again, wondering whether or not he'd received her previous text. It just disgusted me. When I didn't come to bed, she came looking for me. I dove on the couch and pretended to be asleep. Over the next few weeks, I came to terms with things. It was a big adjustment. I became a far better actor than I ever thought I could be. We still had sex more or less as regularly as we had before. I don't know whether or not Aaron enjoyed it as much, but I sure did. I didn't have to concentrate on pleasing her anymore because I just didn't give a damn whether she got off or not. I had to look at things from a totally different viewpoint instead of thinking about Aaron as my wife that I loved. I just looked at her as some woman I was sleeping with. Our sex was raw and less loving, but at the same time, it was more adventurous. Aaron had always been kind of vanilla when it came to sex. During the guilt period just after the conference when she needed to assure me that she was mine, she rarely refused me anything. I started sleeping with her like that. It was the first time for us, even after all those years of marriage. Before Aaron could protest and tell me that she wasn't the kind of woman who did that, she was. The next year, when conference time came around, I watched her intently, looking for a sign that she was in contact with Randy. I checked her phone account online to make sure that she hadn't received any calls from the Boston area. She hadn't received any, but she'd sent several texts to Randy's phone. She'd become more and more frustrated that Randy never answered her. She tried calling a few of her friends, who also knew Randy, and found out that he'd had a run of bad luck. She found out for the first time that he'd been brutally beaten and robbed following the conference the previous year. He'd also been fired, and no one knew where exactly he was working. She'd sent him several texts, asking him to simply meet her for dinner at her hotel. None of them were answered. Her final attempt came when she'd got one of her friends who knew Randy to go to his house and tell him that she wanted to hear from him. Randy had told the friend that he didn't remember her, and, since he no longer worked in the industry, saw no reason to contact her, especially since he wasn't attending the conference. Reason to contact her, especially since he wasn't attending the conference. Aaron was heartbroken. She told me that she didn't feel up to attending the conference this year. After that, I told her that she needed to go. She went every year and suffered through it. This year shouldn't be any different than last year. What's different, I asked her point blank. Even though I already knew, my flight landed two hours after hers, and I watched her the whole day and almost blew it. Erin didn't even stay the night she flew back home at the end of the day. While she was heading for the airport, I called her and told her how much I missed her. I told her that I had to go out of town for the evening, but it didn't really matter since she'd be at her conference. She told me that she couldn't stand us being apart, and she was flying home early. I guess I'd expected her to try to hook up with another guy, but she didn't. The following year, she tried to get me to go to the conference with her so she could show me how boring it was. After that, she simply stopped going. For the last two years, Aaron has been totally faithful to me. I have, from time to time, either watched her myself or even hired a pie for a few days. She hasn't done a thing to arouse any suspicion. If I didn't know any better, I'd have thought that she was the perfect wife. At least she tried to be. The problem was that once trust is gone, things will never be the way they were before. So when we sat out on our deck and relaxed in our big swing together, I always wondered if she was thinking about Randy and how their love would last until one of them died. When she woke me up on a lazy Sunday morning by going down on me, I always wondered if she was imagining doing it to Randy. As a result, I was never able to give Aaron my heart totally again. No matter how romantic she tried to make things, I always looked for an ulterior motive. For the past five years, Aaron has been simply a maid, with benefits, and a very expensive one. In the two years before the divorce, I looked at her body often. Sometimes, I felt like a farmer inspecting his crops. Yep, her tits are starting to sag, I'd notice. It won't be long now. Or, 
I'd see a few more lines on her face. We're getting there, I'd think. Aaron, honey, I'd say. Have another piece of cake. Crap. Eat a big one. I don't want me to get any fatter, she'd say. I love your. I'd tell her. So it doesn't matter. She'd smile and hug me or give me a peck on the cheek, which was all I'd allow. She was sure that I meant that no matter how fat she got, that I'd still love her. But I meant that it didn't matter because I was sure that our marriage would be over soon. So she could eat a cow or look like one and it wouldn't matter to me. Our life was good. On the surface, we had friends that we did things with and we spent a lot of time with our daughter and her husband. Things were good. For years, I actually believed that Erin had almost forgotten about her affair, or she thought that she'd gotten away with it. After all, five years is a long time. If nothing had been discovered after all that time, did it still matter? A couple of days before the ill-fated dinner, one of my pie friends in Boston had given me the news Randy had been fired from his latest job. He was working in the fast food industry. Because of his drinking, the manager wouldn't let Randy work inside the restaurant. He was taking care of the landscaping around the restaurant for minimum wage. He shoveled snow and cut grass on other days. He had to wear a costume that made him look like the restaurant's clown mascot and spin a sign that invited passing drivers to eat in the restaurant. Randy had fallen pretty far over the five years. He was now in his late 40s a college graduate who worked for minimum wage, dressed like a clown, hawking burgers. All of his co-workers, except for the store manager, were 18 years old or younger. They used Randy as an example of why going to college was a waste of time. One kid told his mother right in front of Randy. She'd come to make the kid quit working at the restaurant because his grades in high school had been slipping. What's the point, May? He asked her. Even if I graduate and you and Pop spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on me going to college like Randy's parents probably did, back in the last century, how do we know that I won't end up back here? In that clown suit. Crap, ma. I'm better off than he is right now. And I haven't even been to college. At least I work inside the restaurant, and I make more than minimum wage. If I go to college, I might make even less. As I've said before, Randy had once been a proud man. Hearing the kid's sermon on the state of his life drove Randy further into depression. Randy was so distraught that he didn't pay attention to where he was flinging his sign. Some of the observers said it was on purpose, others swear it was a freak accident. Randy threw the sign up in the air, and it came down, on a customer, shocking her and knocking her bag of food out of her hands. She started yelling at Randy, and he went berserk. When the police arrived, he was still kicking one of her hamburgers down the street, as if it was a street hockey puck, and calling her names, Randy was fired on the spot. He got his last check and used it to buy himself a bottle and a rope. He went home, and before he started drinking, he used his college degree one last time his degree was in manufacturing technology. He manufactured the best noose he could, climbed up onto the edge of a chair, and started drinking, with the noose around his neck. As he drank, he thought about all of the joys and mistakes in his life. He thought about his career and its downward spiral. He thought about his daughter and how she no longer respected him. He thought about his wife and how they had once been a couple that everyone they knew envied. Now, she barely tolerated him, and they slept in separate bedrooms. It hadn't been the changes in Randy's career that had doomed his marriage, it had been the way he handled each successive failure. They'd just been pulling further and further apart over the years. Part of it was that Randy was always waiting for the other shoe to drop. Randy died, never knowing that it had been me all along, ruining him. He thought that it was just bad luck I'd always intended to tell him someday. It would have been my final stroke of vengeance, but I never got the chance. The last thing that Randy thought about before drinking himself into a stupor, losing his balance and dying was Aaron. He traced the beginnings of his bad luck to his friendship with her. He was never honest enough to admit that he'd had an affair and slept with a married woman. He blamed all of his bad luck on Aaron. After all, the start of his bad luck had been when Aaron's husband had discovered them and beaten Randy so bad he was hospitalized. Everything had gone downhill from there and simply never stopped going. His last thoughts were a wish that he'd never met her. His last words were about her two-ducking witch, he thought as the alcohol in his system caused his brain to shut down his consciousness. When I wake up, I'll figure out some way to get back at her. Randy's wife came home and discovered the body. It was sad that she couldn't even come up with enough emotion to cry. In a way, she felt glad for him because her husband had really suffered in recent years, and at least this way he could move on. He was beyond his pain and suffering. One of Aaron's former colleagues who knew her and Randy had emailed her and told her about his death and how it had come about. She'd called her and got all of the details about the last few years of Randy's life. Aaron was shocked. I'd heard from my PI before Aaron was notified, so I knew to expect something. She was definitely off her game. I watched her and couldn't tell if it was because she'd lost someone that she loved, or if she was just thinking about how fleeting life is. That night, she tried to make love to me, to death. She held on to me like she was worried about losing me. She even cried a little. When I asked her why, I don't know what to expect. I guess I was expecting her to tell me that she'd lost a friend from her past. But what she told me was anything but that. I just love you so much, she said. And I'm so glad to have you. I don't know what I'd do if anything ever happened to take you away from me. Yeah, I know it. I'm a sucker. And the woman got to me. One last time. 
That night, the second round was different. We made love like we always used to. I did things to her that I hadn't done in years. Instead of pounding her like a drum and then going to watch the news, I spent a long time just kissing her, holding her, and letting her know that I loved her too. I stupidly believed that I was healing and I could trust her again. It was as if, over the past five years, a scab had finally formed over my wounded heart. The next night, as we had dinner with Sammy and Darren, I held her hand as we ate, and we gave each other longing glances. Samantha had even asked us why we were still so much in love after all the years we'd been together. Then, Aaron had to go and open up her big mouth and ruin it all by trying to get Samantha to name my grandson after Randy. Things were never the same. I'd spent years preparing for the moment when all of this came to pass, and I knew then why. Everything, everything I did to Randy had just never been enough. It wasn't as if I hadn't done enough to Randy. What I'd done to Randy over the years had been the equivalent of unloading a full clip into him and then reloading the clip and emptying it into him again. The problem was that Randy alone hadn't been responsible for my pain. In fact, he'd been the lesser of the two evils. Randy hadn't promised before God and all of our friends to love, honor, and cherish me all the days of his life. That had been Aaron. In fact, before I'd confronted him in Boston and whipped his ass, I hadn't known Randy at all. What I had done for the past five years had been bad. It had been shameful, and more than anything else, it had been cowardly. It was as if I'd been a normal-sized high school student, and one of the big, hulking guys on the football team had pushed me down. So to get revenge, I ran across campus and beat the crap out of one of the nerds on the chess team. Most of my revenge had been misdirected. While Randy did deserve a bit of it, Aaron deserved more. In the days following the dinner, Aaron tried to come home, only to have me give her all of her clothing and personal items that I'd packed for her the first night. She called me, and I wouldn't speak to her, other than to tell her that I thought that this coming Saturday would be a good day for her to come over to the house and take any furniture or appliances that she thought she deserved. I suggested that she bring our daughter and son-in-law along. One of them could call me to verify that the items that she took were not against my wishes. I told her that I'd arranged to be gone all day Saturday, and I'd come back Saturday evening when she called and told me that she was done. It didn't quite turn out that way. When I pulled into my driveway Saturday evening and went into the house, Aaron was still there. Samantha was there too, and they wanted for us to sit down and have a talk. John, I love you, she said. I love you with all of my heart. I'd never do anything to purposefully hurt you. I'm sorry. I'm so much sorrier than you'd ever believe. Oh, I believe you're pretty sorry, I said. You may be about the sorriest excuse for a wife that I've ever seen. Can't we talk about this, she asked. We've been together for almost 30 years. We can't throw all of that away over something that happened and ended a long time ago. John, why didn't you confront me about this when you found out? I can't imagine how much pain you've been carrying around with you for the past five years. I'm beginning to understand a lot of things now. I understand why there's been a wall between us for the past few years. This is the reason, isn't it? No, I sighed and nodded. And that last night was so wonderful, she said. It was the best sex we've ever had. You must have found out that Randy had died, and you thought this was all behind us. Until I opened my mouth, I nodded again. John, can you let me talk, she asked. I really need to get this out of my system. I know that what I did was wrong, but it's been over for years. And yes, I know that you ended it. And I have some questions I'd like you to answer when I'm done. Okay, Aaron, I don't have to listen to anything I said. I could throw you out of here right now. I am going to let you have your say, but only for one reason I want to get this divorce over with and wrapped up as quickly as possible so I can move on with my life. If I listen to you now, you'll have had your say. So, you won't be able to go to the courts and tell them that I never gave you a chance to talk about things. So start talking. But first, there are a couple of things I'd like you to explain while you talk. When did this start with Randy and why? Okay, John, this is 2010. We got married in 1980, so I guess it started in 1982, she said. So, this has been going on for 28 years, I screamed. I had no idea it had been that long. I guess you and Randy looked at it differently. Maybe he only counted it from when you guys started sleeping together. I looked at Samantha, and she looked at her mother. John, there's no chance possible that Samantha is anyone's child except yours, she said. The conference is in July. Samantha was born in January. It's just not possible. But you kind of hoped, didn't you, I spat. Don't tell me that the possibility of it never crossed your mind. Samantha looked at her mother, and the expression on her face wasn't good. Sammy, Angel, I love you more than life itself. For the past five years, you've been the only person I could trust completely. Most of my heart is yours, baby. But could we do a DNA test? It doesn't matter now, in the least. I'll never treat you or my grandkids any different. I just need to verify this, I said. John, I already told you, she began. Why should I believe anything you've ever said, I asked calmly. From the very start of our marriage, you've been lying to me. The whole time. Since our marriage is over with. It means you did lie to me for the entire marriage. No, John. It's not like that. I love you, she said. I've always loved you. You just don't understand. Well, start talking, I told her. I'm giving you time to make me understand. But you need to give it everything you've got. This is the last time we'll be speaking without going through lawyers. John, you're not serious, she said. I only cheated on you once. 
and that was years ago. It isn't worth throwing away 30 years together on. For the past five years, I haven't seen or heard from Randy. You're punishing me for something that ended a long time ago. I think that's unfair. You're not thinking straight. I know you haven't, I said. You know I haven't. What she asked. I know you haven't seen or heard from Randy in five years. You did try to contact him four years ago, though. The year after the last conference you spent together. You tried to find out when he'd be arriving at the conference. For your yearly get-together, but he didn't answer any of your texts. You tried to get in touch with him through friends. The friends told you that he didn't remember you. He did, but he was afraid. He knew that if he answered you, I'd either beat him completely to death this time, or, worse, tell his wife and ruin his marriage. So, you know that it's over, she said, smiling. How do I know that I asked? The last thing you sent to him five years ago was a text message where you told him that your love would last until one of you died. It's barely been five years. But, oh wait, he is dead now, isn't he? But, then again, maybe you weren't lying after all. You did love him enough to try to get Sam to name my grandson after him even though it cost you our marriage. No, John. You don't understand, she said. You and I had only been married for two years when I went to that first conference. I met Randy there, and he was the nicest guy. I missed you a lot. It was the first time I'd ever been away from you. I kept leaving the lectures to try to call you, but you were working. Randy and I started talking, and he just made me feel comfortable. He was so much like you. The next year we met again, and we got even closer. We even had dinner together. We talked, and we kept talking until they threw us out of the restaurant. I never wanted to stop talking to him but you have to understand a lot of it was because he was so much like you. We hadn't been together for that long, and sometimes I needed to run things by someone to see how you'd react to them. It wasn't until the fourth year that we slept together, and then it was an accident. We'd both gotten really drunk, and we just ended up in bed. We woke up the next morning, and we were both consumed with guilt. We could barely even look at each other. We didn't even say goodbye. The next year was the fifth year. We kind of avoided each other, but there's no way that he was her father. We didn't even have dinner or talk that year. The next year, he came over and told me how sorry he'd been about everything that had happened two years prior. He blamed it on himself and told me that he thought it was stupid for us to avoid each other because of a mistake. So we had dinner. And to tell you the truth, for over two years, I'd been avoiding him and fantasizing about what sex with him had been like. We'd both been drunk and I wanted to remember what it had been like. So at that point, it had been six years and we'd only slept together once. Once. And then it had been a drunken thing. That year, dinner was all that happened. The following year, again, nothing happened but there was this weird tension between us. It had started to seem like we only went to the conferences to see each other. Year eight, just to break that tension, we had sex. I feel the most guilt about that one. For the past three years, I'd been avoiding him and fantasizing about what sex with Randy would be like. It was awful. It was worse than awful. And it was boring. You already know that sex isn't really about size, but Randy's equipment was not really your equal in terms of dimensions. And worse than that, I guess Randy had been with his wife for a very long time, and he knew exactly the kinds of things she liked. However, they weren't the same things that I like. I realized then that I'd made a terrible mistake. The next year, I avoided Randy again. I don't mean that I didn't have dinner with him or just didn't have sex with him. I didn't even speak to him. I basically hid. I did go over to him towards the end and pretend that I'd just run into him after looking for him for a long time. I asked him a lot of questions about his wife and then left. The year after that, John, we'd been going to that conference for 10 years. Randy was waiting for me at the airport. He kept telling me about how special that year was. We'd been friends, as he called it, for 10 years. It was like our anniversary or something. I ended up giving him a mercy sleep and suffering through it because I didn't want to hurt his feelings. He really was a nice guy. Yeah, I said. So nice that sleeping with him was worth more than your own marriage. John, you have to understand. He really was a lot like you. And I didn't want to hurt his feelings. Plus, it only happened once a year. There was nothing wild or strange about it. It was like old people's sex. On the other hand, look at what you and I do. There was no comparison. Randy wasn't experimental. It was like romantic sex. Without the romance, I've never given him a blowjob. And he's only been in one place, if you know what I mean. Aaron, you don't understand this, either I said. You and I started getting experimental after I found out about you. Think about it, I let you give me blowjobs but I don't go down on you anymore. I'm not sticking my mouth anywhere that Randy's been. And I started sleeping with you because I wanted to have something that Randy hadn't had, but also because, in a way, I wanted to hurt you and make you do something that you didn't want to do. Until a few nights ago, the time that you just said was the best sex we ever had. You and I haven't made love either. There hasn't been any romance because, on my part, I was just sleeping with you like I'd do a hoe. You were just there and you were available. Her face fell a little bit then. So, for the next few years, I just survived it. I knew that every year, I'd look forward to being with Randy at the conference. He was a great friend, and though I dreaded it, I knew that I'd have to endure having sex with him at the end. A few years after that, I started making up excuses. One year, I was on my period. The next year, I put up with it. The following year, I claimed that I had a yeast infection. The year after that, I was on the rag again. So, I went about three years without having to sleep with him. Then we'd do it, and I'd skip a few years. The year that it ended, we hadn't slept together in four or five years. He always talked about it like he really loved having sex with me, but it was like pulling teeth for me. 
but he was my friend. He liked hearing how much I cared for him. We often told each other we loved each other. I never really felt or meant any of that. I just didn't want to hurt him. So you chose to hurt me instead, I snapped. John, how were you hurt, she asked. It had gone on for over 20 years. Years, when you found out. In that same 20 years, you and I probably had sex literally over 2,000 times. And I loved them all. In total, I had sex with Randy maybe eight times. At the very max and hated every time that I can even remember. If it had been a case where I put Randy ahead of you, I could understand it, but that never happened. If it had been a case where I gave you sloppy seconds or did something to embarrass you, I could understand it, but that never happened. I love you too much for that. This was a once a year thing that happened so far away from where we lived that no one who knows us would have been in the vicinity. So there's no way that you've been embarrassed by this. And even the year that you beat poor Randy up and ended it, it was already ending on its own. Since you know about my text to him, you probably also know that we had spoken at dinner about how much better things were, that we weren't having sex, just enjoying each other's company. That relationship would have ended on its own soon anyway. I was never going to have sex with him again. That was what I meant by we were better, without the guilt. I was just trying to let him down easily. I figured that the relationship would naturally drift apart without me having to hurt his feelings. John, you have to believe me. I love you. I love only you. Whatever I did with Randy was just a stupid mistake that I made a long time ago, and I didn't know how to get out of it. You and I have so much more history, love, and life together. Please don't throw it all away. I sat back and looked at her, trying to process everything she'd said. The anger inside me was still boiling, but I could see the pain and sincerity in her eyes. This, this was the woman I'd loved for decades, the mother of my child, my partner in life. But the betrayal cut so deep. I understand, Aaron, I said slowly. I understand that you made a mistake and that you regret it. But the fact remains that you betrayed me. You betrayed us. Every time you met with him, every time you said you loved him, you took something away from us. You destroyed my trust, my faith in you, in our marriage. While I can see that you're sorry, and maybe even understand why you did what you did, I don't think I can ever get past it. Tears streamed down her face as she listened. John, please, she whispered. I will do anything to make this right. Anything. Just give us another chance. We can go to counseling. We can work through this. Please, don't end our marriage over something that's been over for so long. I shook my head. It's not just the affair, Aaron. It's the lies, the deception. For 28 years, you've kept this from me. For 28 years, you've allowed me to believe that our marriage was something it wasn't. You took away my ability to make an informed decision about my own life, about whether or not I wanted to stay with someone who could do that to me. You robbed me of that choice. She sobbed uncontrollably, and Samantha reached out to comfort her. Dad, please, Samantha said. Mom has made mistakes, but she's trying to make it right. Can't you at least try to work through this? For me? For the grandkids. I looked at my daughter, the pain in her eyes mirroring my own. Sammy, I love you. I love you more than anything. But this isn't something I can just forgive and forget. It's been eating away at me for years, and I can't live like this anymore. I can't keep pretending that everything is okay when it's not. Aaron tried to speak again, but I held up my hand. Enough, Aaron. I don't want to hear anymore. You've said your piece. Now, it's time for me to move on. I'm filing for divorce. You can take whatever you want from the house, but I need you out of here by the end of the week. Dad, please, Samantha begged. Don't do this. I'm sorry, Sammy, I said, my voice breaking, but this is something I have to do for myself. I can't live with this betrayal any longer. Erin collapsed into a chair, her body shaking with sobs. Samantha knelt beside her, trying to console her. I stood up and walked out of the house, the weight of years of betrayal and pain pressing down on me. As I drove away, I thought about all the years we'd spent together, all the memories we'd made. It hurt to think that it had all been tainted by Aaron's affair, by her lies. But I knew that staying with her would only prolong the pain. I needed to find a way to heal, to move forward with my life. I spent the next few days getting my affairs in order. I filed for divorce and made arrangements for Aaron to move out of the house. Samantha tried to talk to me several times, but I couldn't bring myself to discuss it further. The decision was made, and I needed to focus on the future. The day Aaron moved out was bittersweet. She took only what she needed leaving behind many of the things we'd accumulated over the years. As she walked out the door for the last time, she turned to look at me, her eyes filled with sorrow. John, I'm so sorry, she said, her voice barely a whisper. I know, Aaron, I said, but sorry isn't enough. Goodbye. With that, she left, and I was alone in the house that had once been filled with love and laughter. I knew that the road ahead would be difficult, but I also knew that I needed to find a way to rebuild my life to find peace and happiness once again. Over the next few months, I focused on myself. I threw myself into my work, spent time with friends, and even started dating again. It wasn't easy, but slowly I began to heal. I realized that while Aaron's betrayal had been devastating, it didn't define me. I was stronger than that and could find happiness again. Samantha eventually came to terms with the divorce. She still loved her mother, 
but she understood why I couldn't stay. Our relationship grew stronger as we supported each other through the difficult times. In the end, I found peace in knowing that I'd done what was best for me. I'd reclaimed my life and my happiness. And while the scars of Aaron's betrayal would always be there, they no longer controlled me. I was free to move forward and build a new future, one filled with hope and possibility. Five years have passed since that fateful day when I finally walked away from Aaron. I've spent those years rebuilding my life, but the pain and betrayal still echo in my mind, especially after the shocking revelation that Samantha isn't my biological daughter. The truth came out during a heated argument with Aaron about the divorce settlement. Aaron, in a moment of desperation, blurted out that Samantha was Randy's daughter. A paternity test confirmed it. It was devastating. The girl I had loved and raised as my own was not biologically mine. The betrayal cut even deeper, and it was the final straw. Samantha, despite everything, stood by her mother. She couldn't understand why I was so adamant about moving on. It was like a knife in my heart when she chose to support Aaron after all that had happened. In the end, I decided to remove Samantha from my will. It wasn't a decision I made lightly, but I felt I needed to take control of my life and my legacy. We split our possessions 50-50 with Aaron taking half of our savings and some personal items. I kept the house, but it felt empty without the family I once thought was mine. So I sold it and moved into a modern apartment in the city. The transition was hard, but I found solace in my work and slowly began to date again. It was during a business conference that I met Lisa. She was a breath of fresh air intelligent, kind, and genuinely interested in me. Lisa had her own successful career as a marketing executive, and her life story was refreshingly free of the complications that had marred mine. She had been married once before, but her husband passed away in a tragic accident. Despite her loss, she remained optimistic and full of life. We started dating, and for the first time in years, I felt alive again. Lisa had a way of making me forget the past and focus on the present. Her presence in my life was like a healing balm, slowly mending the wounds that Aaron's betrayal had left. While I was finding happiness again, Aaron's life took a turn for the worse. After the divorce, she moved into a small apartment and tried to find a job, but her depression and guilt consumed her. She began drinking heavily, and her health deteriorated rapidly. The weight of her actions and the loss of her family took a severe toll on her. Aaron's attempts to reconnect with Samantha were met with limited success. Samantha, though supportive of her mother, couldn't fully understand the depth of her mother's actions. The strain between them grew, and Aaron felt increasingly isolated. She tried to find solace in alcohol, but it only pushed her further down the spiral. Eventually, Aaron lost her job and ended up on welfare. Her once vibrant appearance faded as she battled her demons alone. I heard from mutual friends that she had been hospitalized several times due to alcohol poisoning and severe depression. It was heartbreaking to hear, but I couldn't bring myself to reach out. The woman I once loved had destroyed too much of my life and I needed to protect my newfound happiness. Samantha, despite her efforts to help, couldn't save her mother from herself. She had her own family to care for, and the burden of her mother's decline weighed heavily on her. The rift between us remained, but I found peace in knowing that I had done what was best. Lisa and I got married last year. Our wedding was small and intimate, attended by close friends and family. It was a day filled with love and hope for the future. Lisa's presence in my life has been a constant source of strength and joy. We've built a new life together, one free from the shadows of the past. Looking back, I realized that the years of pain and betrayal were a necessary journey to bring me to this point. I've learned that forgiveness isn't always about the other person, it's about freeing yourself from the chains of the past. While I may never fully forgive Aaron, or forget what she did, I found a way to move forward and embrace the happiness I deserve. Aaron's downward spiral is a tragic reminder of the consequences of betrayal and the importance of honesty in relationships. As for Samantha, I hope that one day we can rebuild our relationship. But for now, I focus on the life I have with Lisa, grateful for the second chance at happiness that life has given me.